Oh, oh my God, my heart, my black dead heart. It started beating again and then Liv Zander tore it out of my chest. She showed it to me and then drop kicked it over the bar for a conversion, laughing at me all the while. How cruel, or one might say, how vicious. Today, following a brief mourning period wherein I nursed a righteous book hangover, I am talking about Feathers So Vicious, book one of two in the Court of Ravens duet by Liv Zander. All I can say is, strap the fuck in. We're diving straight in and I'm going to give you the Goodreads blurb, which by itself is kind of a work of art. More treacherous than war are the battles within a heart. Perched between branches and shadows, we watch, we scheme, fighting for a kingdom forgotten and forlorn, until we rip her away with our claws, our prisoner, our pawn, our plaything. She's innocent and pure, fragile and helpless, but oh so guilty by blood. She calls us beasts, wicked and evil, vicious and cruel. We are all that and worse. One of us offers her shelter beneath his wings, whispering promises of pleasure, seeking redemption. The other longs to shatter her into a million pieces, whispering promises of pain, seeking revenge. Caught between our feathers, she endures our deranged desires, our secrets, our lies, our twisted plans. Will she surrender to our darkness or fight for a destiny growing ever elusive? Welcome to the Court of Ravens. Little White Dove. Feathers So Vicious is a full-length dark fantasy romance novel and book one in The Court of Ravens duet. The two-part story features two morally grey raven shifters, a young woman at the mercy of their shadows, and a happily ever after. This world contains dark elements, violence, and themes that some may find disturbing. Readers can find more detailed information on the author's website. What this book doesn't contain is a hero because villains do it better, and two do it better than one. If that doesn't sell you on a book, I really don't know what to say. I don't know what possibly could. Needless to say, it had me all a tingle. It certainly pulled me in and piqued my interest and made me feel all kinds of intrigue. Disclaimer before we carry on. This is not safe for work. It's not meant for other ears. Really, it's probably not meant for any ears. I will be keeping it spoiler free when it comes to the story itself, though discussion of tropes, triggers and other elements may constitute mild spoilers by the basic definition of the term, so bear that in mind. I would also suggest that if you struggle with dark fantasy in general or the darker themes, then this might not be for you. Hopefully this review might help you with that decision if you're on the fence, but I just also wanted to note that I will be talking triggers Also, I wanted to note that any mispronunciation of any places or names is all completely on me. I read this as opposed to listening to it, so hopefully I get everything right. If I don't, feel free to at me. The first thing we're going to talk about, probably the most important thing for many of us, is the tropes in the books that we read. This one has a lot. I'm going to focus on the main ones, just quite a few. The first one, or probably the most important one for most of us, is enemies to lovers. If this wasn't obvious already, essentially there is a war going on between the humans and the ravens, and Galantia, who is our main female character, is betrothed to the human prince. She is captured by Sebian, a pathfinder in service to the Prince of Ravens himself, Malir, and then she is handed over to said prince. You don't get more defined sides of the fence, folks. This is definitely enemies in the truest sense of the term, mortal enemies even. It's really, really strong here and I think very engaging. Next up, we have the why choose trope. We also call that sometimes the menage trope as well, depending on the uh, circumstances between the two male elements. But Galantia has interest from both ravens for two completely different reasons. Ravens, despite some of the other issues that they may display, apparently seem to respect the female's choice in suitor, so she gets to decide. Both Sebian and Malir feature prominently in spicy scenes. 
Next trope we have is the virgin. This, you know, our main female character isn't innocent in this area. And this is usually one of my least favorite tropes for a lot of reasons. But how Xander deals with this appeals to me so much more than the usual kind of very vanilla manner with which the virginity is usually dispatched. It is striking. Uh, I have said too much. Read it for yourself and you can let me know how you feel about that one. Next up, we have the no heroes here slash villain trope. There is no disputing this. There's no honor on the battlefield between these two sides. War is a messy business. And with that comes so much horrible crap done on both sides to each other. There are no heroes here, really. Malir, in particular, never acts in any other way in this book other than villainous. At times, it is true that one can sympathise with him, but the shades of grey here, even during those grey moments, are super dark. Then we have the DS dynamic, the dom-sub dynamic. Galanti is often not in control in many of the scenes that she shares with the leading men. She is a captive, a hostage, and she's desired and often can't escape that. While Sabian wants to have her screaming his name beneath him with pleasure, though, Malir wants her screaming in pain. And, you know, we don't get any holding back here in this regard when it comes to that trope. Lastly, for the main tropes that I want to discuss in this book, uh, this we have an interesting one. Okay, so this is S T F U A T T D L A G G. I hope I said that right. This is um, a new one to me. The concept isn't new, but the acronym is. I've only recently come across this, and perhaps unsurprisingly, I deciphered it immediately. So it's going on my revamped favorite tropes list. I think that's S T F U A T T D L A G G. Do you know what that means? Answers on a postcard. I won't even give you a clue. Next, I need to talk about the triggers and where to start here. I mean, I could make a full length episode on the triggers alone. All of the consent triggers are here. We've got non-consensual rape. We've got sexual assault. We've got dubcon, that's dubious consent. And we've got CNC, which is consensual non-consent. This is all massively prevalent. We're not talking about maybe a mention of a non-con scenario. We're not talking about something that happens off the page or not even, you know, when the assault comes about and the character is saved before things go too far. Not at all. Nobody gets saved here. It happens to characters on the page, in front of characters, and in some cases it happens in flashbacks. We are also looking at graphic violence, gore, graphic murder, graphic torture, graphic assault, explicit sex, BDSM, power exchange, death, infant death, infertility, captivity, and a cliffhanger ending. In amongst all of that, we've also got things like knife play too. Uh, the author has an extensive list of all of the triggers present in this duet on her website, which I will link to. And this is partly why I take such an issue with some of the reviewers who have, by their own admission, read the trigger warnings and then proceeded to mark ratings down because of that content that they've been warned about. Knowing the nature of the material before you begin and then complaining about it afterwards, in my opinion, kind of negates your review. I think it's important to identify your triggers or boundaries, and it's even more important for those boundaries and triggers to be respected. But the responsibility is on you to heed those warnings and act accordingly. Saying that non-con isn't a trigger for you and then proclaiming representations of non-con in a work of fiction is gratuitous and leaving a two or three star review in response, I feel is questionable. It's poor form. It's not really professional. Everyone deals with assault and PTSD differently, including fictional characters and including the author of those fictional characters. And no one person is the arbiter of trauma. Everybody deals with it differently. There is no right way or wrong way. It's okay if dark isn't your bag. It's okay if you prefer something a little bit more vanilla. Nobody is going to yuck your yum. I'm certainly not going to. But as such, you should extend the same courtesy to others. And I'm going to leave this particular debate there. I do find it very interesting. I'm curious as to the rationale behind some of the reviews that I found while I was researching this book. 
But I suppose you could say I got triggered by people who were triggered by triggers or trigger warnings, maybe more accurately. But what can I say? It did spark something in me, much like this book did. So I'm kind of pleased that the two seem to go hand in hand. Now we've come to the portion where I usually talk about the spice, you know, the spice level, how much of it we have. But quite honestly, I don't think I need to go much further into this. This is a five star book. It's got five star spice. We are talking a five chili pepper rating of hotness and spice here, or even five chilies plus, 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 to be quite honest with you. There is a lot. It's balls to the wall, windows to the wall. It's it's just literally such an integral part of the story in this book, which is what I am going to talk about next. We're going to talk about the writing and the story itself. There is such a beautiful, hauntingly dark poeticism and at times a lyrical style and sway to this book that I find so appealing. Good grief, the language does not hold back either. It's honestly filthy in places and I'm not talking about the spice itself, but rather the prose in general. Xander does not shy away from anything. Nothing is unexplored. Nothing is left out. Every scene is laid as bare as the characters themselves. And it's something special. With that said, I did notice a couple of things that I mostly associate with writers not writing in their native tongue. An unusual word choice here or an inverted phrase or sentence there. This is by no means a complaint and it does not detract from the exquisite writing. But as a multilingual person myself, it did kind of shake my immersion once or twice. It reminded me a lot of a friend of mine who is German and a fantastic writer. I mean, her characterization, how she pulls me into a story. It's all next level as far as I'm concerned. But every now and then she'll make a choice that reminds me she's German. This is a really easy fix though. You just, you need a native speaker in the language that you're publishing in, preferably a writer, I would say, to beta for you. This is a really useful tip for anybody who's writing in a language that's not their native tongue. Liv Zander, if you're in need, I am your girl. Put me in coach. I am so here for your writing. I loved it so much. And every now and then something comes along that changes how you read. It changes what you read. It's like a personal trend going on inside. And sometimes it's it's temporary and the book experience informs your next choices. But in other cases, it becomes more ingrained. This is one of those stories for me. If I hadn't had the next book to dive straight into to continue the story, I may have pulled a raven and plucked myself bald out of grief, to be quite honest. This story is a wild ride and it's dark. It's twisted and grey, which I've spoken about at length already. And I don't want to continue to flog that dead horse when there are other things and other characters that we can flog instead perhaps but let's put all of those tasty delicious things aside for the moment and talk about fundamentals and fundamentally this just works on all of the levels the setting is original it may be curious and eager to learn more and the environment itself engaged me and even though the historical period explored in the story is just a span of about a decade it was still rich and I never once felt like I needed more I was given everything that I needed. I wasn't slapped in the face with hundreds of pages of exposition and building. I was just presented with a curated snapshot and nothing else. Because the purpose of this book isn't to tell the story of the world Xander has created, but rather it's to tell the story of the broken people within it. And our main characters are broken, let's make no mistake about it. And they're offered up to us naked and bleeding and crying, snot and drool and all of that for us to feast upon. Everyone is working through serious trauma and issues and the author never shies away from how ugly that can look. This is what takes precedence in this dark romance, in my opinion. It's all about the journey through the pain. The balance between that pain, the sweet release, spice and plot is just perfect for me. Now, of course, this will always come down to personal preference, but the physical and sexual elements are really required to tell the story of these people and to do it justice. So it makes sense to me that it's a major element. It's inescapable, really, particularly when it comes to Galantia and Malir. 
Galante is our main female character. She is young, innocent, and has led a remarkably cloistered life, essentially locked away in a tower. Malir is one of the two ravens in this menage, a deeply scarred and twisted prince who is very much initially presented as a hateful villain. Sebian, the second raven in this strange little thruple, works sometimes as the softer foil to Malir's abuse, but make no mistake, both of them are equally self-serving. But their sexual chemistry with the male-female character, both of them separately, it sizzles off the page. And while Galantia is indeed naive, she's also sharp of wit, often very logical, even in the face of danger or pleasure, and increasingly self-aware as the story unfolds. Bad things happen to Galantia, and we are right there with her. We experience what she does through the author's masterful presentation of her trauma, and it was hard not to feel deeply for her, and even for Malir in parts, which is the genius inherent in creating a sometimes sympathetic villain like the author has. The reader feels as bare as the female protagonist by the end of the book and we are left on that cliffhanger and if I didn't have the second book to dive straight into like I said before, I needed it, I may have thrown my Kindle at the wall had I not gotten it. So for anyone a little worried about resolution within the duet and it's a legitimate worry, I can see why you might have concern, there is a happy ending in Shadow So Vicious, a happy ending of sorts. It's not the most conventional and it is a tough journey to reach it, but the story is wrapped up beautifully, I think, and all of those loose ends are tied up. I found it very, very satisfying. Was this my favourite read of 2023? It honestly might have been. I'm going to have to think on that. It was certainly easily in my top five. So now, without further ado, I would like to present and introduce to you our cocktail that's been inspired by Feather So Vicious this week. I've called it an unkindness of prose. And I flipped back and forth on this one a lot because originally I planned something in honour of Galantia, but unfortunately the name I was going with for that cocktail might have been just a little bit of a spoiler so I'm going to keep that for the second book which is called as I'm sure you know by now Shadows So Cruel and I'm going to stick with this one for now. I really really enjoyed it it's very fitting uh, particularly there's you know Galantia vibes here as well along with the colour it is a, a like a blackberry rum cocktail I think is the best way that I can describe it. It's deep, it's rich, it's quite tasty. There is a little bit more involved when it comes to prep with this one than my previous concoctions, but honestly, it's so worth it and it's a real crowd pleaser. I made this in and around the Halloween week. This was the perfect book for Halloween vibes, by the way. And when I had a few people over, I made a batch of it and it went down really, really well. If your crowd of friends are equally as dark and twisted as you are, uh, I'm sure they'll enjoy it. I hope so, because we all deserve weird friends. For this, you're going to need blackberry simple syrup. I am going to lay out a really quick recipe for this for you, just in case you can't get it anywhere. It's kind of unusual. Plus, blackberries are important here. I used frozen, but if you have access to freshly picked, absolutely go for it. That is one of the things I miss the most about home, autumn and the run up to Halloween is prime blackberry picking season in Ireland. You're going to need limes, you're going to need black food colouring and I'll talk more about this a little bit later. You'll need rum. This should be white rum. I used Bacardi, that's a staple of any home bar. You'll need lemon and lime soda. Sprite is fine for this if that's all you have ice obviously and you can use any kind of glass that you want. The first time I made this I used a martini glass and it was really fun, quite classy actually but the second time when I made a larger batch I had mason jar glasses with a handle which made me feel you know suitably fantasy or kind of old-timey which is really nice too. So first off we're going to make the blackberry simple syrup. For a batch of four cocktails heat a third of a cup of sugar or say about 100 grams for those of us who use filthy metric. The blackberries, about half a cup, so just over a generous handful. Three lime wedges, throw them in there into your pot. Two tablespoons of lime juice and 
three quarters of a cup of water or 175 mils for those of us who are sane. This should be all heated over medium heat and you need to let that simmer for about 10 minutes. Then take your mixture off the heat and smush up your blackberries, smash them. This would be where as well you add your black food coloring. Literally just one wee drop will do the job. It's very, very strong. If you're interested, you can also use activated charcoal in this cocktail. That's not for everyone, but it does add, you know, an interesting color and texture without actually changing the taste of anything. If you were to do kind of an event with this, I would definitely recommend using the charcoal. There's a little bit of a, a novelty to it as well. And if you go all out and use dry ice and all that kind of thing too, it looks suitably spooky, but it's totally up to you. Much like the food coloring though, if you go with the activated charcoal, you do not need a lot of it. A couple of pinches will do. Then allow your mixture to cool for at least another 10 minutes, then strain into a cup. Store, cover the cup and then store it in the fridge. That's very important and you can leave it there. After that, then the cocktail itself is a breeze. To make one in your shaker, you will need one ounce of the blackberry simple syrup that you made earlier. That's about 30 mils, a generous measure of rum. Do your home pour, my friends, all up to you to taste. And then a squeeze of a wedge of fresh lime over the ice. Close it and shake. This is your 20 second wanking arm workout right here with your cocktail shaker. If you don't have a cocktail shaker, like I've said before, you can use anything that has a lid on it. Something ceramic will do as well, as long as it has a lid on it because you don't want the stuff going everywhere. You don't want to waste the beautiful alcohol. Strain then into a glass of your choice. Make sure you strain it. This is over a few cubes and then top it up with the lemon and lime soda or the fizzy drink of your choice. I definitely recommend using that, though any kind of carbonated, maybe apple drink could be interesting. And I've made a note here that I want to try that out next time because apple and blackberry go together very, very well. I garnished it then with blackberries. You can use whole ones. Then I sipped on my unkindness while I read the prose. What more could a body want or need? Has that convinced you? I know my book hangover after I'd finished The Court of Ravens duet certainly convinced me of how taken I was by this story. More please, absolutely. I will eat up anything you want to serve me in this genre. Luckily, I now have Iron Flame to nudge me out of this book slump that I've been in. It's what I'm reading this week and what I'll be talking about in the next episode. Before I go, I would like to take an opportunity to thank those of you who have been in touch with your greetings and suggestions and recommendations. I love those. And I've really enjoyed this awesome sense of community that has been built around our shared love of reading fantasy and romanticy in particular. You guys are fantastic. There have also been some questions for me, which I wasn't going to um, give any airtime to, but I'm hoping to answer in the next episode because some of them were really, really good and very interesting and I think might spark some discussion. So until then, feel free to slide into my DMs, uh, give the pod a follow or a subscribe. And as I always say, stay smutty and lay which, by the way, is Irish for read well. <laughs>